All right, so John did a great little intro on production design, um, but uh, just to kind of reiterate it and you know give everyone a little bit of a warm up, um, I want to uh, talk about it briefly a, a little bit what about what I do. So for now, you know we're all on camera uh, pretty much all the time right now. Um, and uh, this is some screen grabs I pulled from the last couple weeks um, of different presenters. And if you look at everything in these frames, as John mentioned, everything around that, the, the actor or the, the, the people speaking, um, uh, everything behind them and around them in the frame is production design. Um, the walls, the colors, the props, um, the books, the ceiling, you know, all of these elements have to do with what is ultimately my responsibility as a production designer. Um, and you can tell a lot about these people based on what's around them. So if you think of all of these as as actors or characters, you know, what what is what is this frame telling you about what this person um, who this person might be? And 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 so uh, as I mentioned, so I think the, the kind of thrust of this talk today is, is I'm interested in these qualities um, uh, of production design that, that, that are core to what I do every day that seem to be a, to a little bit, they seem to be a little bit on the edges for architecture, that these, these words and terms that, that for me never seem to come up as much in architecture school. And the more I work as a production designer, I find that I'm, I'm, I'm relying on these things you know, every day to, to work as a designer. So that's one big thing. And the second big thing, um, which I'm really obsessed with, um, is that you can't visit a building for the first time twice. And, and that is very similar to me in terms of that you can't um, you can't watch a movie for the first time that there's something really special about that first cinematic experience of um, of, of visiting a building or seeing a movie for the first time and so I'm really interested in in that kind of um, in in the, the the audience or the viewer making a correlation between them and the visitor to to a, to a building. So um, as a little, um, you know, continuing on this little warm up. So I just want to throw out a couple of kind of, you know, iconic frames in, in film history and just think about, just start thinking about production design. Think about the elements in these frames um, that are everything except um, the actors. And just, you know, what you immediately with each of these know there's a whole narrative and a whole story, I think, that just gets generated just from a single frame. Some recent ones in television. And, and the last thing I'll say about kind of the job and what I think is interesting is, is well, you can't you know, visit the same, same building twice or see a movie for the first time twice. You can retell the same story. And you know, the Batman franchise does this better than anything. We've seen this story over and over and over again. And these, these chapters in, in the kind of Batman film history, the, one of the main reasons these films all feel so different is that the tone and the design of them are all really different, but it's all the same story. So you have the Tim Burton Batmans, which is a very dark kind of 20s, 80s vibe where um, all the color in, um, in these movies is actually on a surface. And then you move into the kind of disaster Schumacher movies, which um, color we see starts to come from light and we see a kind of um, cartoonification of, of Batman um, where the story feels uh, less serious and more comical, more comic booky perhaps. And then Christopher Nolan, you know, he says when he reboots the series, he says, no, 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 Batman exists in our world. This is very much a, a, a character in a universe where you could walk out on the street and, and meet these people. Um, he also does this amazing thing with the Batcave, we're inverting the Batcave. So the Batcave where we're, we think that that's gonna be dark, you know, he puts a light all on the ceiling. So we have, you know, an in inversion of expectations there. And then even the Joker, you know, set in the 70s, um, presenting Gotham City in New York, basically as these series of caverns um, that our character is at the bottom of. 
So that was kind of kind of the teaser there, warm up. Um, and then just practically, which we can talk about maybe in the Q&A, you know, exactly what I do every day, but this just to make sure everyone's kind of clear on terms, like, you know, John mentioned this kind of triumvirate of key um, creatives and you have the director there at the top and then the DP, which I'll use that word, you know, little phrase a lot, the director of photography or DP and the production designer. And the three of us kind of make up the core visual storytelling decision makers um, for a project. Um, definitely following the lead of the director, um, but, but the, the three of us um, are kind of are always collaborating closely. And then you can see they're listed kind of the different sub departments that all report up to, to each one of these. Um, and I just threw in at the bottom costumes and special effects and visual effects don't report to the production designer directly, but they're, they're departments that are, um, there's a huge amount, amount of overlap on, on how that works. So here, so to, to, to get going, like, uh, I'm going to start mapping out these qualities and I've got kind of the, the architecture on, on the left there and, and these kind of um, TV film uh, terms, you know, on the right and, 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 and I'm going to try to go through this a little bit kind of chronologically and, and, and how, um, how the, I started building the world of, of Russian doll um, in particular, the, the loft space. And, and I hope, um, Many of you have seen the show, but if not, um, you know, hope this will this will give you um, uh, a, a good overview. So, so, um, so every you know project is, you know starts with a script for for production design, and in some ways it's similar to the program that you get um, in architecture. But you know, the programs you know generally I find are quite clinical, they're just a list of facts of what, what the client needs or what the project demands. Um, and so on the left there, I just kind of have like, what would be the program of, um, of the, the, this loft space that's in the, the kind of hero set in Russian Doll? You know, it's just very basic, um, you know, facts. Uh, in, in the script, in the production design world, you, you're getting a lot more um, uh, abstract language. Um, and it's all wrapped around a character. And most scripts are mostly dialogue. Um, and so this is a, this here is a, a scene description uh, moving into dialogue, but you don't get very much, you know, it's just a few, a few clues. And this is from, I think, page one of the first episode of, of Russian Doll. And, you know, as I was first tackling the design for this job, you know, these are some words that start to jump out to me um, on, on, on that could be some sort of design trigger or inspiration of, of what the set needs to start to feel like. Um, and as I read the, the pilot and the next two episodes, which is all I had when I started um, out of eight, uh, episodes, um, it became clear that uh, this show was about a character moving through the same space over and over again. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, lots of spoilers coming up, um, but that the the main character, Nadia, is reliving her 36th birthday party over and over and over again. Um, initially in what we think is almost like a Groundhog Day, day scenario, but that there's a, a couple of twists that come. And Ultimately, the, the story is a is is this this trap in a in a maze in a labyrinth um, is as much physical as it is mental. So so there's this task in the design that it has to almost feel like we're in someone's mind. And here is uh, how I first started tackling this, and I love this because this is Natasha Leon who played Nadia talking about the back of my head on Seth Meyers. Um, and this is my first week on the project. I made this diagram and this is all of the times that, um, that Nadia uh, dies and resets in the same space. Um, and this is me starting to map out what she's doing um, every half hour of her day. And so that's the, the the reality of the character and the kind of program, you know, of of what the story is starting to demand. Um, and just like architecture, where you have to come up with a concept or a diagram, I find that a really helpful way to 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 get into a project. Um, and so 
so there's a series of concepts that that start to unfold on how the design approach worked for um, for Russian doll, and there are two key ones. Um, so one from from the the script page, uh, there's thinking about this notion of a rabbit hole, this kind of reference to Alice in Wonderland and letting the bathroom where she's resetting the actual mirror be a portal. Um, and that's actually the rabbit hole. And then as she's leaving the bathroom, moving out of the rabbit hole, she's entering into Wonderland. Um, and so we decided early on that we were going to build um, the loft on a stage and every, the world beyond the loft would be um, uh, Wonderland and would be found locations. So you'll see a mix of, of, of the two and that those are both things that are um, part of my work as a production designer. So some early reference images that I pulled, again, thinking about a rabbit hole, thinking about this journey through the loft and into Wonderland. Um, some, some early film reference images that I used to pitch and get the job. So again, we're set, we're in New York. So I'm always thinking about how do we, how do we see New York, um, maybe in a little bit different way in a little bit more mystical way, because as soon as we wrapped our, our, um, our minds around or embraced, uh, Wonderland as an approach to the story, um, the typical rules of reality um, were lightened a little bit for us. So here are the early concepts, sketches for the floor plan of the loft. Um, and you can see the two images on the left. I'm actually thinking about movement um, and mapping out sequence. Um, and this is both the journey that this character will take through the space. Um, but also potentially where the camera will go through the space. And, and quickly, um, you know, I was thinking about this abstractly, you know, as this journey being a set of concentric circles and being in a way quite literal about um, what a Russian doll is. So those sketches um, within about, uh, you know, probably four days turned into um, the beginning of a plan. So you see the plan here for the loft on the left and the right is um, basically a ceiling plan. So one of the things we have to think about is which, um, which parts of the set are gonna have a hard ceiling and which ones will be open uh, above for additional lighting. So you can see, see the plan there. And there are those paths through the space. So, so this is where she's resetting. Um, this is the bathroom that she's in, uh, where she's resetting. And this is how she starts to move through the space. And so one of the things I had to think about with this is that we're seeing as an audience, it's unusual for us to see the same space over and over and over again. And how she leaves the apartment actually becomes really important to the story um, that she's she starts, she starts leaving quicker. So part of the design had to allow her to move through, get all the way front to the front of the building and move through the space more quickly. Um, and so you can see these kind of somewhat concentric loops um, uh, roughly showing that those, those, different, those different options. And again, this, this project too is about a, a mental space and, and choice. And so I wanted her to have as many choices as possible. So you can see kind of in the middle um, here uh, that there are five doorways that she potentially can move through and choose to go through. Another layer to this is that we have to match this space to a location that exists in the real world. So the, the building on the left was our original location, which we lost um, uh, or couldn't, couldn't quite book. And so we found around the corner another um, building, a church that, that worked. Uh, so one thing we had to quickly do was change all of the uh, windows in the space from a, an arch to a Gothic arch as you can see. So this, we, um, this, the building on the right became the, the exterior location of the interior of the loft that we were building on stage. And that's where, that's the floor. That's the, 
the space in the building where we were making a logic of, of where she would live. And here you can see an elevation and section of what that started to look like. So I've talked about this a bit already, but really, again, thinking about sequence and, um, you know, it's something that I, I would, you know, invite and challenge the student, you know, the students watching to think about, you know, in architecture, I feel like it's always about section and section is really, really important, but a section in many ways is an, is a expression of a sequence through a building and a section only goes in a straight line, you know, but a sequence, you know, sh can shift laterally. And so I just would, I just would, you know, think about the sequence of um, the, the, the kind of first time, you know, a visitor to your, to your work. So here highlighted here is moving out of the bathroom, um, kind of what that sequence might be out of the rabbit hole and a couple of more inspiration images there on the right. And again, this starts um, at the mirror and with this mention of this door that, that uh, has, has become, I think, famous in its own way unexpectedly. So this is kind of my process thinking about what that door needs to be. And you can see down here how it was described um, in the script. Some early sketches and that door ended up being made out of just layers of wax paper it's very um, DIY. Here's a, here's a rendering that we did, very crude SketchUp. We had almost no time. So I, I built the SketchUp model for this just to, to prove what this sequence would be to, um, to the director and the showrunners um, and uh, 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 the cinematographer and show them, um, there's an animation that goes with this, show them what that sequence uh, can be getting into materials. You know, we're in an old building, so the materials inside need to match what we know the outside looks like. And here it is under construction. I decided to make the, the, the Gothic language on the outside of the building part of the tunnel that she, she leaves on the inside. Um, and there is the finished. And here it is on camera. So we see the portal rabbit hole and the beginning of this tunnel where she starts to walk into, um, into Wonderland. Moving out into the hallway. I really love this image on the, the lower right because that doorway in the distance is intentionally not symmetrical with the doorway of the bathroom, um, showing that there's another path, a choice that she could take to go right um, or to go, to go straight. So a really, really subtle shift, um, but that I think makes that frame more interesting So we're just slowly starting to move outside of the bathroom and outside of the loft. Just a little reminder there of, of, of um, these kind of two core concepts. So we talked about sequence and the next one that I wanna talk about is saturation. And I, I, there's a lot of words that could go here. It could also be color, um, it could also be texture. Um, but I found, for, particularly for Russian Doll, this notion of saturation became a really, really core concept for, for the show. And this is the, um, the diagram that I created to help me and the other departments think about, um, think about color um, in the show. And so it's not just the production designer that has to think about color and saturation. It's also the costume designer and the cinematographer as it relates to light. And the three of us have to be on the same page as it relates to color. Um, and so my pitch to them was that as the center of this universe, the center of Nadia's mind is the loft, and that should be the most saturated, the most colorful space in the show. And we started plotting other um, locations in the show, in the series, um, 
as they moved far farther away from the loft. And the logic here was that, you know, as Nadia is trying to figure out what's going on, trying to solve the case, she's almost like she's in a video game and the, where the edges of the map are black. Um, and so as she moves from the center, exploring more of the map, um, or, or maybe moving to the edge of something where she's off track, the world starts to turn black and white. So there's this gradation of saturation, um, which we also did with texture. So the textures that are in the loft are really um, tactile and rich. And as you move near the edges of the world um, to these other locations, everything starts to flatten out. And this, again, we're working very, very quickly. We had five weeks of pre-production on Russian Doll. A tool like this, a diagram like this, just becomes a really helpful thing for you know, all the other departments, all the other creatives to, to, to just to lock into and um, just use as a, as a baseline um, um, for making decisions. So here are some, some reference, other references and inspiration for the loft, thinking about that um, degree of saturation. And this is kind of the next tunnel that she moves through. So we start to see that um, density of light and color and, and texture and saturation on the walls in particular, you know, using a wallpaper that actually has um, got some texture to it. And there's the frame. Here's a few more showing um, kind of sketch, construction, photograph, and then when it's lit um, at the end there. So this is the kind of main, a view of the main living space, the party, a bedroom, I was particularly interested in artwork that had awareness. So a lot of the artwork are faces that are looking back at the viewer, looking looking at Nadia, almost as if the world has, um, you know, is, is watching. Another picture of the living room. And there it is on camera. You can see behind her, these five openings, different thresholds marking different different paths that she can take. So let's look at a clip and I'm gonna see if this works. One moment. So, everyone with me? Doing good? Okay. So I just wanna look at, um, at the beginning of the show, essentially, um, and uh, and showing that sequence. Um, let's see. All right. Is that working? You guys see anything? No. All right, hold on one sec. Uh, let's see. Let's try one more time. Lizzie. Still nothing. Okay, hold on. 
Net Netflix may have an option that blocks it. That might be what's happening. Uh, worked yesterday. Yeah, I guess it, it must not, it must not. All right, so I'm gonna, we're gonna skip it. Um, sorry, I tried it yesterday and it worked. I just had two clips. So I would encourage everyone just, you know, if you have time, watch just the opening moments of, um, of the first episode. And it actually shows that sequence of her walking from the bathroom to, to the front. Um, and you can see the widest loop that she takes th through the apartment. Okay, so let's get back. All right, um, so three more um, kind of uh, kind of cinema language um, things that I want to talk about. And the last one for Russian Doll is this notion of reflection. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to think about reflection, not just a reflection in um, in a, uh, uh, a mirror or, a, or glass, but also this notion of like balance or mirroring in the frame. Um, and so there's this other character that we meet in Russian Doll named Alan. And Alan is the opposite of um, Nadia in every single way. And he is also dying and, and resetting at the same time, also in a bathroom. So right there, we have this kind of mirroring or reflection um, happening in the story. But they're also polarities, kind of kind of opposites of each other. So how do we want to make sure that the production design is emphasizing their difference while also showing where they they have some sort of kind of cosmic um, cosmic bond? And so at the top here, you can see um, again, where we plotted these locations, and you can see that Alan's apartment and and Nadia's apartment are kind of the same degree away from the loft in terms of saturation. So that gave us a strategy for texture and color. Um, and then we also just made them very different um, by ascribing these, these, these opposite terms to them. So where Nadia is right, Alan is left, that's really important. She's night, he's day. You know, you can see these kind of rules that we mapped out on, on in terms of how to approach them. And this notion of left and right became really important for the cinematographer and the director in terms of blocking of where to put these characters in the frame and how they move through space. So here, showing that choice again. So Nadia, after she meets Alan and starts to realize that something is going wrong, um, she actually turns left out of the bathroom. So all of her other journeys to leave the apartment are going right, which is what she's comfortable doing. And as soon as she goes left out of the apartment and out the, the fire escape, the whole world of Wonderland, you know, changes. She's on a new path. And so that that physical, the, the, the production design and the set design is actually um, forcing her to go one way versus another way. And then you can see that sketch in the lower right hand corner, which is which is showing um, again this kind of light, light and dark. And we decided to to build those bathrooms back to back. So you can see roughly there the loft, you know, on the right. And then we had this other character's bathroom that we we latched on to, to the other side of it. So a shot like this is actually done practically. Again, she's round, he's square, she's dark, he's light. She's warm, he's cool. This notion of reflection in those two doorways behind them. Again, warm and cool behind them. And then here's reflection in, in the glass. And even in, the, in this, they got the left to be cool and the right to be warm, which is, I think, a happy accident on that one. And then a few more that, again, show the world beyond the loft. So we're moving into their apartments. So this is a before and a before. So Alan's apartment is on the left. Nadia's apartment is on the right, the before images. And we've moved away from the middle in terms of saturation. Here's the after. 
So different temperature, um, but similar saturation. Even Nadia's wallpaper is made up of circles and squares. There as well. And as the story progresses, there's this almost cross-contamination where Alan, who's the clean one, trashes his apartments and Nadia, who's the dirty one, Alan cleans her apartment. Um, so we start to see these two characters um, almost infect each other. And then lastly, as I mentioned, as we move near the edges of this map, the world starts to go black and white. So we can see you know, this character Beatrice's apartment and where Nadia works. Um, very flat, black and white and gray, uh, straight lines, very limited texture. And these are things I don't think, you know, track, you don't notice necessarily um, as the audience, but it's a, it's a subversive thing, um, which I think is really key to the work. And just a couple more images of them out in the world. So for the last two bits, um, I wanna talk about another show that I worked on called Dare Me, which was after Russian Doll. Very, very different. Um, so this is a um, you know Midwestern high school kind of cheerleader noir um, you know, crime thriller. Um, and uh, so it, you know, it requires a completely different strategy. Um, this was also material that was based on a book. Um, and the, sh the, the showrunner um, kind of head writer was also the writer of the book. So having her as the source material was really, really special. Um, so I wanna talk about light first. So keep light kind of in your mind as we move through this. And, and, and again, I think in architecture, you know, it's always about openings, like where are the openings, you know? And, and um, and I think that we forget sometimes in, in architecture to, to speak about the quality of the light and that that light can be both natural and not natural. Um, and uh, and that, that you as the designer, you know, um, can think about mood with lighting, you know, um, and, and this, this area as well, in terms of what I do, there's a, there's a really key overlap with the cinematographer. So, so lighting is, falls underneath the, the kind of purview of the cinematographer, but light that you see in the frame, so a light fixture is my department. And so we have to constantly be working together because sometimes that light that's in the frame is also what's lighting the talent. Um, and it's important that the talent, that the way the talent is lit, it, it falls underneath the cinematographer. So there's a, there's a constant, um, communication and creative cl collaboration there as it relates to light. So this is a, a, a quote from um, the book, uh, which uh, I love and I, and I really, really um, responded to. And this notion of the fish tank right here in the middle, fish tank effervesces, you know, became a kind of core concept um, in tackling the production design of the, of the series. And this is kind of a teaser because this is showing um, this is showing what we did. So so that that um, text right there. This is the visualization of that text. Um, this lone guy in a sad apartment with this kind of eerie fish tank, and the 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 kind of metaphor of a fish tank. Again, we just ran with with the design of the show. Um, this notion that that you're in a glass house that that you can always see and be seen, um, that there's this kind of voyeurism, and that the sets and the locations have to facilitate that voyeurism, that looking. So here's the color palette that supports that. Um, so so a lot of um, you know I really like this notion because because we're we're with cheerleaders here. Uh, I like this notion that these athletes are aware that they're being looked at um, and there's a rejection of that uh, being looked at that, and, and that what I wanted the design to do and what we all wanted to do as the creatives of the show is not make a um, kind of fetishized cheerleader show. You know, this is not what media has told us that cheerleaders look like. These are athletes, um, they're tough, you know, and so the color palette of the show is actually these toxic colors that are rejecting 
being looked at, if that makes sense. And again, um, as we move into locations, like this was the high school location that we chose for the show. Um, and we're in the Midwest, a kind of industrial town. You know, I wanted the high school to almost look like a factory. Um, and so we found a high school we shot in Toronto that, that looked like a factory. And here are some images from, from the actual high school. So we shot in the high school for the pilot. But for the series, because they were in school, we couldn't shoot there. So we have to build um, the high school on a stage. So these became really important images for making sure the material, the light, um, reflection, uh, the, the, sc the scuffing and aging um, of, of the actual location matches what we build. So here's the plan of the high school set that we built. And in the middle there is this fish tank that, that, that I wanted to, to land in the middle of the high school. So we designed this space that is, is an almost all glass box in the middle of this kind of you know 50s high school. And what this does, it is, as you move around this, it allows you to shoot through layers of space, um, through layers of glass, and see characters in multiple distances from each other. And it's highlighting, again, that sense of looking and, and, and voyeurism. So that's how that concept manifests in a plan. So here it is um, in SketchUp. And again, we've taken the, the design language from the actual location and injected it into this new concept of a fish tank. And here's the renderings under construction. This was a huge set, 6,000 square feet, I think. Here is the reflected ceiling plan. So, you know, not special lighting, but showing where all these lights have to go. And the, 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 this is a hard ceiling set, which means that all of these lights are what's illuminating um, most of the scenes so that this DP can go in and turn turn them all on and off however however she wanted. Um, and because we had such a tight squeeze on the stage, we also had to think about where all the windows were. And up here at the top, we did this huge wall of windows so that the light could be blasted in really deep into the set. So you can see that here with the staircase. So that bottom right image I love because that looks like the actual high school, but that is the set. And the fish tank there is on the left. So again, this, this is about looking voyeurism. So here's a couple of images of, of that fish tank working. And, and again, the bottom right, that hallway, what that looks like where she's standing looking across. There it is all, you can, you could look all the way across the set diagonally, which is pretty cool. And then moving into um, the locker room uh, and still thinking about this, this notion of a fish tank and also the quality of the lighting of fish tank and that the lighting of fish tank is, is light under underwater, you know, which has this kind of ripple or layered effect to it. And so I found this, um, this light uh, baffle that kind of gives that quality of, of, of light. Um, and you, you see it kind of back here a little bit on the wall and we'll see it in a couple of other places. Um, but I wanted to show these four together because these are essentially the same space. Um, or parts of the same space lit different ways. Um, so we have the harsh lighting from up above. Um, we have different lights turned on in the um, in the locker room, um, you know, for different moments in the show. Uh, we have sun blasting in in one. We have moonlight blasting in on another. So so again, um, you know, thinking about how the quality of the light changes how you as the viewer, the audience. Um, uh, it triggers, you know, thoughts of the tone and the mood um, and, and, the, and the shape of, of that space. So here's that, that fish tank quality of light here on the wall. 
and by this point in the story, these characters are really drowning. Um, so it's a it's a a pretty direct metaphor there. And then our last thing is place and location. And, and as we're we're moving out into the real world, um, out of the set, um, how do we kind of choose all of these? places and locations so that when we see them all together in a show, they, um, they snap together and they give this co cohesive um, um, and kind of uh, tonally powerful um, experience of watching the narrative. So we took that notion of a fish tank out into the world for how we strategize finding locations. And so on the left, we have this um, Gregory Crudson photo that was a core reference for us, um, which is all about looking all this kind of, you know, fish tank portal. And on the right is um, an image from the, from the show where, where we're clearly referencing that image where, and we found a house for our main character um, full of these windows where she, and, we, and I intentionally said no curtains on the front window so that there's no way for her to, to, um, to, 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 to hide, you know, she's on display. Here's the back windows, you know, this is my favorite image from the series. Um, you know, fish tank behind her, um, these creeping vines of curtains and this just massive spider of a, of a chandelier that's kind of the, the main uh, source of light up above. So this is us going into a location that we like and changing everything in it, including the light fixtures so that it fits the story. Even where one of our characters works, we lucked out finding this location. But again, the whole front of it is a fish tank. You know, you know, we could have a shot from really far away looking into that space. And it also immediately makes you feel like you're in the Midwest. A couple of others kind of connecting the tone of the show. And it looks like I can't do the clip. So the clip was kind of the big finish, um, uh, which if you want to watch, it's the very end of episode seven um, that shows um, how we took this notion of the fish tank and incorporated it into um, uh, basically the crime itself. Um, uh, and that that sequence, that clip is is, is great because it really it's it's also about sequence and it kind of shows all of these different different elements um, hopefully coming together. So no no big finish I guess on a on a clip, but uh, that's that's what I got. <laughs> Michael, I've got I've got the first minute and a half of uh, Russian Doll episode one. If you want to try and watch the screen on that, so I've got a. a Preview. Yeah, if you could, if you figured it out, I mean, yeah, I can me, maybe I try the other one. Do you want me to try? I can try the the big finish really quick because um, I had it queued up as well. Uh, uh, yeah, I just got a screen grab of the of uh, Russian doll. I had to go through kind of a back way to do it. Oh yeah, do it. Yeah. Okay, let's see if this works. No sound, however, because that would be you talking, I think. So, mm -hmm. you know, this works. Image? Yeah. I've never watched it without sound. So all elements from the script. And again, she's gonna take the widest possible uh, walk through. That's pretty good. Cause this, this goes on for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So there's part of it. 
Cool. Thanks, John. You bet. All right. Okay. Good. There's your big finish. Sorry, it's not the right, the wrong. That's fine. Word. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I think we'll uh, we'll queue up questions and stuff. But, but before we do that, I just wanted to to uh, throw a couple of things out out at you in in, in listening. Um, and I didn't say in the introduction, but I, but I wanted to just to to reinforce what you said about how how quickly uh, this all happens. I mean, mm -hmm. they'll, you'll, they'll, you, you'll, you'll draw something in the morning and they'll build it in the afternoon. That is how mm -hmm. rapidly you work. So you have five weeks yeah. to do all the design and planning production line, everybody up, get it all ready to shoot. So that's a very, very short amount of time. Uh, lots of people moving, a lot of things begin to happen. I just, I just want to point out or, or reiterate that uh, uh, many, many production designers just get buried and swallowed up with the problem solving aspect with this. Like we need to shoot an apartment, we need to find some place, they find some place and do this. And I just wanted to uh, make, make sure how clear it was, how, how strong an intellectual approach and how much rigor you're uh, applying to this process. Having the strategy about the concentric rings, having a color palette, something which could move from saturated to desaturated, something what's happening with textures, Having a uh, strategic approach that could be conveyed to the other players is an incredibly uh, intelligent approach to it, a way to keep your head above it as a designer, instead mm -hmm. of just being uh, down into the trenches solving the problems like so many people do. And it really shows in, in all of the work that you're, that you're doing here. Uh, I particularly was impressed with the layout of the apartment where there is the development of Z space or long space or axial space or the tunnel space that's derived from the script, which arrives as an opportunity and part of how the movement of the camera and the, the participant could, could be experienced mm -hmm. in relative to the story. And I just wanted to compliment you on, on how you're able to solve the problems, make it beautiful, and then maintain this, this level of intelligence uh, in, in the approach that you're doing. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I think that, you know, I this really is a skill I learned in architecture school and I don't know why I did it, but like I found that like the 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 falling asleep time, you know, the little sleep you get is really valuable design time because I would imagine myself walking through my own work, you know, like really deeply doing it, not from a zoomed out standpoint, but like really cinematically like imagining what it would be like to walk through a project. And I don't, maybe everyone does this, I don't know, but I, I feel like, you know, as a student you can get, and even as a professional, you can get sucked into the realities of um, all the things that are required to deliver the project. And you forget to just stop and 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 be really mindful and take that time to, to wander. Mm -hmm. um, and what was so great about this project is that journey was so clear in the script. She has to do it, you know, like, and, and not only does she do it, you know, at the beginning of the show, she does it 22 times, you know? So like we, like that has got to be an interesting experience for the audience. And that's not just on me, that's obviously hugely on the cinematographer, which, you know, everything I showed you today was framed and lit by really, really talented cinematographers. So I don't mean to overclaim any credit. Um, they are the ones, you know, uh, who do that beautiful work, but um, hopefully you can see that that there's a really close collaboration between us. That the that the the sets are designed to facilitate beautiful cinematography. Wonderful. Well, this will be the Q and A period. Is that uh, <clears throat> that correct? And uh, I think Leora, you you'll manage any that come through YouTube. And if uh, students have questions, then please uh, enter them into the chat and we'll direct them to, to Michael. Jacob Middleton has a question. Do you want to, can I give you the screen, Jacob? Sure. Go ahead and share screen if you wish. Or just, I guess uh, we'll double click on, just talk, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, firstly, I wanted to say thank you. I'm actually applying to grad school right now for design for stage and film. So your lecture today was very, very impressive and inspiring um, and just wanted to thank you. Um, my question is what advice would you give to yourself 
um, however many years ago about like entering the industry or like what do you wish you could tell yourself um, back then? Um, I, I don't I don't know if I would have much to say, um, but I but I but but like keep going, you know. I mean, I think that that um, you know, there's definitely right before I got Russian Doll, um, which there's no question changed my career. Um, you know, like I I'd been doing a, a just a string of independent movies that I'm really proud of, you know. But a cert, at a certain point, you know, I was like, I need I want to know what I'm capable of, and I need more money to do that, you know, uh, or I need to be on bigger projects. Um, and so, you know, like just keep going. Like every project that you take along the way, if you find a way to connect with it creatively. Um, and get a couple of good images or learn something about budget or, or a camera or, you know, whatever you're learning on the way with those little projects, they become these little stepping stones in building out a portfolio of work um, and, bu and building your confidence, you know? So um, I think I would just say, um, yeah, keep, keep going and, and, and truly like only take work that you can get excited about because if you can't get excited about it, you will not do a good job, you know? And it is much better to not be working than to be working on something that sucks. <laughs> as, as an observer, as an observer, I just want to build on that and say that, that you, Mike was always had an enormous amount of initiative and self-drive and the, the desire to, to show up and, and do work in exactly the way that you just talked about. Uh, Michael Cornwith, who's a person that went through our school for a couple of years in the RPF and has a couple of Oscar nominations for the for uh, some some film work answered that question by saying just start out by getting on the board just just get some work together and start to know yeah. people and then start to develop learn skills and collect skills but then uh, uh, always pay attention to what excites you and keep your enthusiasm going mm -hmm. it was a very good question thanks thanks Jacob thanks so much yeah, thanks. um Lalitha Kapolin. Are you there? Yeah, Lalitha Kapolin. That's her. But I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for the students to ask. I have a sideways question, so I feel like I should a wait. Sideways question. Uh, Ananya, then, please. Hi. Um, Hi. I want to say thank you so much. This is really fascinating and interesting. Um, so my question is for these two shows, what was the budget like and um, how does budget uh, affect the whole design process? Um, especially, you know, with Dare, Dare Me building like an entire high school set. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's so funny because like when I was like, working on independent movies, um, you know, well, either way, I'm in charge of the budget for the art department. So, so that is my responsibility. Um, and it's a negotiation with the producer and specifically the line producer who's tracking the budget. Um, and, and, you know, they give you figures and, and you, and I'm just quickly learning roughly how much things cost. Like, can we do it for that? Can we not do it for that? Um, but ultimately on these, on these bigger shows, um, the art director and the construction coordinator and the set decorator, those kind of department heads that report to me, they're responsible for their own budgets. So, so they, you know, they're the ones listening to what I'm asking for, crunching the numbers and then telling me how much that's gonna cost. You know, so I'm looking at it now at a little bit higher level and saying like, oh, that cool thing that I wanted to do, um, you know, that's probably a little too expensive. So, you know, it's okay, we're not gonna get that. Or, oh, that's, you know, cheaper than I thought, let's get 10, you know? So so like that's that's more of, of kind of how I operate um, related to the budget. Um, but yeah, they're expensive. I mean, I think, I don't remember how much the high school set cost, but we built that and three, three other sets, four other sets. Um, and I, you know, around a million, you know, I mean, it's, it's a lot of money um, to, to do these. So just to clarify, so for you, like usually the design part sort of happens before the like numbers part or, um, is it all kind of happen at the same time? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll ask like, how much money do you have set aside for construction, paint and construction? And they'll like, the producer will be like, here's what I was thinking, you know? And then I'll be like, well, are these the sets that you were, you know, we'll talk about which sets we think we should build, you know? Um, and sometimes that changes. So like, sometimes I'll come in and say, I don't think we should build that one. I think we should build this one instead. And that's gonna save us some money, you know? And then I'll say that money we saved, I wanna put that into the high school set because I know that's gonna be more expensive, you know? So it's a, it's a really abstract shell game to, to be honest, um, in large part because it's like, I'm not the one that's, I'm not tracking the numbers like on a spreadsheet, you know, like, you know, um, there's other folks on the crew that are helping me do that. And I kind of just get, you know, pulled aside if we've, <laughs> if we've um, spent too much, but I'm actually pretty good at it. Like we don't, we never go over budget. Um, if something, if a director asks for something that's unexpected, um, then that additional money can get approved. Um, and then I'm always, because it's TV and it's rolling, you know, I'm always looking down the line to be like, oh, we had to pay for that expensive thing. Um, you know, we're going to make a change here so that we, we don't have to, to pay for something else, you know, or, you know, when I design sets, I'm making sure that, that we're going to see it all because, you know, producers, they hate nothing more than we build part of a set and we never see it, you know. A question from Motion. Are you okay with that? Oh, sorry, I have to unmute. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Michael, for the lecture today. It's so much inspiring. Also, the colors are so much beautiful. And yeah. Thank you so much. So I have a question about uh, how you uh, have been practicing since you started your uh, uh, like this journey. You know, architecture mm -hmm. school until now. So like for me, when I look uh, to the scenes, like all of these colors combined together, it's so much complicated. Right? So I'm wondering what type of practices you do more usually that helps you grasp more uh, information from the environment around you. A design it's process? Yeah, that that yeah, that you expressed in the movies, right? What do you mean? So, uh, I mean, uh, what you recommend for us as mm -hmm. as a uh, design students to yeah. to do to do more since now, like uh, for example, for example, you you recommend to draw more sketches, do more cat cat practices. What what you recommend? Uh, see. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, and so I almost like opened with a disclaimer of how like almost embarrassed I am to show some of the sketches because they're just so crude, you know, and, and that all of you, I'm sure with all of the other, um, the lectures this semester got to see really refined drawings, um, which, you know, versus like my like really flat sketch up drawing. Um, but, you know, ultimately, they're all skills of communication and, um, and, you know, those little diagrams, you know, are really, really useful, you know, um, to, to, to be able to do and to quickly communicate with other departments. So I feel like my drawing skill set um, has morphed a little bit into uh, communication almost in front of other people, you know, like where you're able to, to draw live and communicate something really, really quickly, whether, whether or not it's a plan or part of a frame, you know, I'm not great at it, but what's more important is how quickly you can do it versus how, how good it looks in a presentation, you know? Um, and, and it moves so fast that I end up with like a pile of just tiny little sketches that are almost meaningless and I have to save them and scan them for stuff like this. Otherwise they just quickly go and go and go in the garbage. So um, I would say that kind of live um, visual communication uh, in front of people is really valuable. And it's got, it goes both ways in production design. You have to be able to communicate up to the director um, and the cinematographer and even producers because they're spending a lot of money. So I have to be able to make sure that they feel comfortable with that. And then I have to be able to communicate kind of down to my team 
um, logistically to make sure they understand exactly what um, how I want something to, to go. And sometimes that is me actually drawing a little detail and say, this is how I want these things to fit together. So does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Chandler, your question. Right. Hi there. Um, so I had a question about um, just anything you'd like to impart on us in terms of uh, interior versus exterior kind of set building and designing, um, because on the two shows and a lot of the work that you shared with us was um, largely interior and you always um, mentioned kind of the exterior settings or, you know, having to change locations very quickly and how that affected the interior and um, kind of the what you wanted from the school on the outside, but um, what, I guess, what's kind of that difference in approach or something you've learned from doing it um, when you get into the nitty gritty of creating sets that are interior focused versus having some sort of exterior element? Yeah, so I, I really love um, the location part of uh, production design and I view it as um, like casting, like you're, you're casting these locations that have to fit together. Um, and unlike in architecture, um, you can create, th that casting is artificial. Like, like it's going out and looking for, for places that not only have to be believable in the same universe, but also in the same narrative universe. You know, so there's kind of two two layers. Like when we were in Toronto, um, making sure it looked like Ohio. You know, it's 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 going around and just make just picking out places and be like, you know, this feels like this feels like the place. This feels like the place. That, you know, and then going another layer below that and saying, this is this feels like the story. You know, um, and and places that maybe can't quite get there, you make a change. So like we made that hotel image that I showed with all the red light, like we added all of that lighting, you know? Um, so the, the, the kind of pleasure in location um, design work is it's more, you know, it's more additive. It, it's more like going out to that place and, and, and um, kind of testing the limits of what we can change um, at that location to emphasize the story um, and how quickly we can do that. Cause sometimes, you know, like the, the dairy cream I think um, we had all these graphics to change and um, more change in that frame than you would think. And literally we're going there in the afternoon because we only have four hours to change it over before the camera shows up and starts filming, you know? Um, so, so, you know, that's the other piece is how, um, how quickly, you know, can we do it? I don't know if that answered your question. The last thing I'll say, the cool thing on Dare Me is I, I mapped out all of the, the locations as if we were driving through this fake town. So I did a fake drive through the town so that the director and um, the cinematographer and the producers could see whose house was near whose and how far they were from the school. And so that built a logic for the town so that later when we were like, oh, we have to scramble to find this new location, we kind of knew what we were looking for because we knew where it would be in the town. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, wow, that's really interesting. Cool. Yeah. That, did answer, that did answer the yeah. question. Cool. <laughs> Very good. Um, Dalitha, would you like to ask your question now? Yes, hi, yeah. hi. Um, um, I feel like I have a right since I was one of your images that yeah. showed up. <laughs> They're like, yes, I have a right to ask this question. Okay, so I'm in film, I'm in film studies and I do film theory and film philosophy. So I'm, that's just cool. to tell you that I'm, so I'm going to, and I've been an interloper at these amazing seminars. So I'm going to come in at that place with you. So it's not about right. practice. Okay, so part of the talk for me, and I have to fess up immediately that my my go-to is the great video essay by Tom Anderson, Ellie plays itself. Okay, for me, that's the big. It's like, what happens when you, like what happens to buildings when you have characters being set against these amazing modernist buildings? And that kind of anachronisms is what I'm thinking of, right? So for me, Russian Doll, by the way, I'm a big fan of that show, so it's amazing. It's just so great. So Russian Doll pushes the limit. So what, the, what you have been and the, the ways in which the students have been asking, is I would call cinema of realism. You want characters to belong in a space and I'm more interested in when that doesn't really happen. 
right? Okay. Like, I mean, you're not, because I mean, this is like, it's Hollywood new independent doesn't really matter. It's still a, a, set, a character driven narrative and I'm less interested in that. I'm more interested in what happens when it's not a character driven narrative within what is called the broader, whatever you may call it, the art cinema, right? I mean, we can, mm-hmm. so in a way when architecture itself becomes like, I mean, the old, old, very old example of Tati's playtime, but put that aside. I'm actually thinking of Tom Anderson's and I'm thinking of people like Lynch, right? Where Russian mm-hmm. doll, I feel like is in an engagement with Lynch's work mm-hmm. um, in an empire, especially with the passageways, et cetera. So in a way that architecture, for me, architecture is, yes, it's, of course we want to be habitants in architecture, but where cinema comes in is precisely not in the belonging, right? It is not, it's the, precisely the eviction, that tension when characters don't belong, that makes for a very different kind of a cinema. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, yes. I mean, what could you tell from my background? I don't know that what I like mid-century furniture, which is recycled. <laughs> okay. That I'm what? I'm a post-colonial <laughs> an immigrant. And do I belong mm-hmm. in this land? Yes, I do. Actually, this is my space, but I don't either. Right. So it's very, like one can't really tell the story so quickly mm-hmm. and easily. Right. And, the, and for me, this is like, it's a joke set. It is my real home, but it's also a joke set. I mean, it's like, you know, being taken over. So in a way that I want, I want American cinema to be different, right? And it's never going to be different because the cinema of, it's a cinema of realism. But Russian Doll pushes that, pushes mm-hmm. that, right? I mean, it's that, that first extreme close up of the revolver that, that got me, you know, that, like, that's it. This is why the show is worth watching. So yeah. can you talk about a little more about the passageways? And because there's something over there that pushes everything off in a different direction. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I again, I think once we decided, you know, and, and this was me with Leslie Headland and Natasha Leon, who are the showrunners of the show, like once we once we gave ourselves permission that um, that everything outside the bathroom was was Wonderland or was a mental space. Um, it freed it freed us up to make all kinds of other d- decisions, you know, um, and and that we didn't that we could let things be um, uh, uh, a little unfamiliar, you know. Um, I mean, one of the things Natasha said is that the show is about addiction and trauma, you know, and that you're 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 re- you're repeating because you just are stuck in a bad habit. You know, so that's the kind of metaphor that's that's overlaid on 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 the show, um, and so for me, I, I just was like, you know, let's let's be playful with it, and let's and actually personally, I I chose things that made me uncomfortable. You know, I I I was I was just you know making choices constantly, but I was like, I don't this thing makes me uneasy, but I think it's kind of interesting, so let's embrace that instead of. Mm-hmm. Um, make it uh, aspirational, which might be what we are talking about with American television where everything looks aspirational. Um, and so, so, you know, I was, we were all very much interested in not pre- presenting an aspirational New York, um, but a, um, a New York that was both magical um, and maybe um, a little bit uh, of a nod to um, the past. That's great. I think I think there's also just just a, there, there's a is there a difference inherently between shooting on screen being an abstract world or a completely controlled world versus shooting on location? I mean, there can be, but I don't know if that was a deci- deliberate decision in Russian Doll. There, I mean, you know, practically we built the loft because we had so many shooting days there. You know, so so that's you know there are these realities that we didn't talk that much about, but like. You know, we shot, I think at the loft for two and a half weeks. So you have to find, if you're shooting on location, you have to find a space that you can do that in New York, which is impossible. Um, And that a crew of 70 plus people have to be able to move in and out of that space. You know, so practically doing it, you know, on a a stage um, made more sense. You know, one of my many challenges was making sure that it was believable enough that it was inside a real building, you know, even though ultimately it matches architecturally, we kind of don't care that it's perfect, you know, um, which I like, you know, I think it, 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 um, it, it's part of that uh, suspension of disbelief, 
you know, um, that, that we have when we, when we move from the loft to, to, to out into the real world. But the, but the trick is like the whole world feels like it's, um, I mean, that is production design that the whole world, the whole show feels like it's part of the same universe, whatever that universe is. Yeah, that's uh, wonderful. And, it, and, it, and if you do it right, uh, ironically, if you do your job really, really well, a lot of people won't notice what you've done just because yeah. it's so beautifully synthesized exactly. in, into, the, into the final work of art. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, uh, you have a, we'll make our final question, I think, to Michelle as we wrap things up. That's right. Thanks, by the way. Um, this was just fabulous and uh, so perfect that you are our, our, our last lecture uh, of the fall. Um, this in some ways ties back to Mosen's question and, and it kind of touches on some of the other questions. And it relates to the binary you set up as it was meant to be kind of a linguistic transfer of, of terms. And I'm, you know, you know, we're thinking about architecture. Architecture is not a stage set. You know, architecture is not static. It's not a series of walls and surfaces. You know, it, it is actually sort of the progenitor of perception. And so if we start thinking about it in perception, if we just took like one of those perceptual categories, which would be vision, and you think about the five different ways we, we process vision, only one of them directly translates to the screen. And that's mm -hmm. movement. Uh, and then, you know, others, you know, don't quite translate. There's a transformation. And then you start losing other parts of these visual qualities. And so I'm, I, I was fascinated when I, I, I saw this because I, I first saw Russian Doll before uh, I knew much about uh, your engagement or what you'd written about it. And of course, movement was the first thing I connected with. And, of course, and then color and, and luminance were, were the next two things that kind of layered on my second time watching that, which are the ones that if you start to think about this, you know, hierarchy, that's the hierarchy mm -hmm. you go on before you start losing those perceptual qualities, but it's not just vision. It's, it's, it's the way we deal with the richness of sound uh, in a space. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. then the part that we lose totally is proprioception, the way our body sort of relates to nearby space. So you, you lose a lot of perception and yet you have mapped it back in. You, you found sort of other transforms to map or, or you, are you using alternative means to map uh, you know, uh, perception back in. And that's one of the reasons why I think this question about uh, drawing is interesting because we think about drawing uh, all of our different modes of drawing as sort of like not just a translation, a spatial translation of dimensions, but also meant to be a transform in terms of, of certain qualities and certain experiences that, that we want to uh, imbue in the space. And I'm, I'm really fascinated by your thinking process on it because it seems like, you know, you're not, you're not working with the, the tools of, of what we would consider to be the tools of sensory perception. And yet you understand something very deeply or innately about what those transforms all. And I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. So I, I think my, my question really relates to how you've developed your knowledge, you know, of, of sort of understanding that translation between the physical bodily experience and what it has to be transformed to so that it reads in two dimensions, you know, on the film. Mm -hmm. And it's also sort of this role in terms of, you know, uh, I don't know that you can answer this one, but, you know, the, these sort of different tools which are about transformation that we should have or need to have at our fingertips in order to do this. Mm -hmm. Oh man, um, uh, I, what to say? I mean, I think that, yeah, I mean, I was in some ways nervous about putting up these as a binary because I, I, I don't, in some ways I don't believe that, but I, but I, but I felt, I felt like it would be helpful, particularly for students to see that, that, that there is this kind of, you know, cross infection between um, physical space and media space. 
you know, um, and, and in some ways the talk is about taking the language of cinema and encouraging students to incorporate it into the language of architecture. But I think what you're asking is how am I taking some of this language of architecture and bringing it into cinema? And, you know, I, so much of that is, is studying architecture, you know, and that, you know, all of the things that we talk about when we, when we do have more abstract conversations about architecture and our work about compression of space, expansion of space, um, you know, feeling lighter, feeling more contained, um, wanting to touch something, not wanting to touch something like those are things that do come up, you know, in, in the conversation of, of architecture, particularly the compression of space, which the frame itself does that automatically. So, so you already have a horizontal frame that is, that is, that is restricting, that has edges, that's restricting space. So then my job is to, to go a, a step inside of that and, and determine um, what those edges around a character um, tell us about them, about their journey, you know, about what time we're in, you know, and that's not all me because all I can do is set up the, a landscape of those possibilities. And then the director and the cinematographer have to find them, you know, like in the frame. Um, and that's all about blocking. That's all about what a, what a, a care, an actor feels comfortable with, you know, like I really believe in, in, in uh, creating sets that are as three-dimensional and as authentic as possible, because that is only going to get a better performance out of that actor to the point where they forget that they're in a, in a fabricated universe. And maybe the color of the walls actually is making them, we are feeling them, you know, uh, we're watching someone respond to the space, um, you know, which is, you know, almost as good as the real thing, I guess. Um, I don't, does that get anywhere near a, a, your, an answer of some kind reflection? <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a great start. And I'm thinking this would be a great course. Yeah. I mean, I'd let John and I have talked about this. I mean, I just, I, I, you know, cause, cause also what we didn't talk at all about is, is, is editing. And, and what I love is that you can, you could begin to think about an architecture uh, in a sequence that is edited, you know, like you could cut together, um, uh, you know, a series of clips and then draw the section of what that experience would be like, which I think could be, would be really fascinating, you know, so. Well, very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Leora, is that it on your end over there? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Very Great. good. It's wonderful thank you all very much. I hope that was helpful. By the way, Michael's in Australia, so it's like 6 a.m. in the morning right now for the lecture and just, just so that you guys <laughs> can, can appreciate the extra. I've been up for quite a while. <laughs> yeah, thank so, you so, uh, so much. So I really good to see um, Keep doing the fantastic work and we'll look for you on the, on the screen uh, in the future. Good. Thank you very Great. much, Michael.